Social networks have not only redefined the internet, they've also proven to be a powerful tool in political processes, such as in the recent revolutions in the Middle East and North Africa. We asked Laura Tyson, professor at the Haas School of Business at the University of California, to speak with us about the political power of social networks. Laura, how impactful are social networks on the recent revolutions that we've seen? Well, I think the word that comes to mind is facilitator or enabler. I, I would not call the network itself the catalyst. I think when you look at this region, you can name a variety of reasons why it was ripe for some kind of revolutionary upsurge. Youth unemployment, surging food prices, corrupt regimes, no succession plans, widening inequality, high levels of poverty. This is a, a very fertile ground for uh, a popular uprising. But to link people whose interest is in a popular uprising, but who otherwise their interest might be different say rural and urban, farmer and um, industrial worker, young person and old person, how are you going to link those people together? And it turned out that social networking and Twitter and also traditional television mm -hmm. were a way to mobilize. So facilitate, mobilize, not a cause. How are social networks impacting the democratic process in established democracies? Right. Well, I do some work for President Obama, and President Obama in that campaign, the campaign where he came really from being an unknown person to President of the United States, he really was able to uh, make use of the new medium in ways which no one else had figured out. And they have become a much more important part of messaging, of outreach, communicating with your constituents, of defining yourself. Uh, of, of discussing policy, but at the same time, at the same time, social networks can be used, and there's good examples of it being used, uh, to uh, spread distrust, mm -hmm. to, uh, you can say something about someone which becomes viral overnight and it turns out it's simply not true, and then to undo that you have to do a viral spread the other way. So I think we're learning, we're learning how this medium will be used in the political process. We've seen some very good examples of it. We've seen some very disturbing examples of it. I actually go to a broader question, which is the role of um, advertising and money in campaigns. And, you know, we in the United States, we spend a lot of money on our campaigns, and they're years in the making. You know, the Obama campaign was a two-year campaign. So uh, the medium will become more and more important in societies where there's a large, a long uh, electoral cycle and a lot of money in the process. Do you think social networks have the power to promote populism to an extent that they might actually destabilize established democracies? I think it has uh, the ability to be used in very positive ways and very negative ways, and we should think of it as a facilitator. So you can facilitate good things and you can facilitate bad things. And if we think about facilitating uh, messages, uh, then, for example, we just we were talking about the uprisings in the Middle East, the Arab Spring, facilitating discontent and bringing people together to, to move those regimes. Uh, you could argue is a positive effect. However, now we have to see those regimes rebuilt. And that takes some time and some patience and some continued bringing together of people with diverse interest. Will social media help in that regard? I, th I think that's an open question. It's just an open question. I don't say yes, I, I, I don't say no. Uh, so I, I think the facilitator tells you that let me give you another example. We know in behavioral economics, we know that people tend to, kinds of mistakes they particularly made, you join a herd. You, ju you just sign on to something because everybody else thinks it. Or you, you are overconfident. You, you believe something because your friends believe it. You actually don't look at the evidence. Well, you can see how social, a, blah, a social network could actually exacerbate those two tendencies. You get overconfident because you just hang out on a social network with the people who think just like you do, and you follow them because they think just like you do. You don't question. Um, there's a value of diversity in decision making in organizations, and of course the more the social network is very focused on people with like opinions, the less you get diversity in making good decisions. So there are examples of how it might end up having a negative effect. I guess what I was driving at is that, for instance, here in the U.S., we tend to embrace things like social media as a sure. way of, sure. of um, propagating democracy in a way, but is there a way in which it 
could be inhibiting. And I think you just gave a really good example of how. So we, we talked about this uh, today. We were talking about it in China. So in China, it's very interesting. China has a very, very active uh, blogging community. Mm -hmm. uh, they quite can, they are, tr but it's quite controlled in many respects. So what do they do? If you want to complain about a local official, say, you can do that, and it, actually people actively do that. They actively complain about local officials, and there are good examples of where local officials have lost their authority because of complaints in China. Mm. They actually also uh, complain about uh, consumer products. They will complain about safety standards. They will also, by the way, there's a huge amount of nationalism uh, in China that uh, we were hearing today, largely in blogs is reflected or social networks is anti-Japan. That that could put pressure on the authorities to undertake an activity which really isn't the right mm. public policy. And then finally, I just want to say, what you learn from the Chinese experience is you can actually also end up controlling certain parts of it. So certain parts of it are quite free and open, mm. and other parts of it are quite controlled. In the US, our general presumption is everything should be open, everything should be able, everyone should be able to say anything they want. And then what I worry about is, again, distorting information, uh, untruthful information which relies, not an ability to determine who's the source of the mm -hmm. information. And I do think there's the possibility of herd instincts, which would essentially be, could be a kind of form of populism. It's interesting. How does everyone end up on Facebook anyway, out of this peer pressure, I guess? Um, <laughs> it's, yeah, that's right. It's something you hear about and you decide you're going to do it. Um, everyone so. else is doing it, yeah, so. Yeah, But people use it also, you know, in, in China and in the U.S., certainly in China, a uh, significant amount of this is done for entertainment and mm -hmm. done for gaming. Even the internet more generally, not social networks, it's largely, it's more gaming than it is in the United States. If I think about active users of the internet that I, that I know or social networks that I know, they're not in general using it for political mm -hmm. reasons. They're using it for their friends. And basically, there's some wonderful studies about by anthropologists now, which suggests that probably most humans can have about 150 people in their real network that they actually can remember the name, remember mm -hmm. the connection, try to keep it up. So you might go on a site for a while, but you're not really very connected to it. You might go off. So Facebook, you may post lots of information, but when you actually look at the degree of interactions, you're really only interacting with 10 people, not 300. Makes it inflates your sense of community. <laughs> it inflates your sense of community, right? Someone said it inflates your sense of narcissism. I've actually now started to see some uh, some discussions of does Facebook make you very narcissistic? Because who does really care about all of your photos or what you just did this morning? Or did you just you so, do? Uh, <laughs> you do, at, but you're presuming that hundreds right. of others do as well. <laughs> I think I definitely notice in my peer group people starting to fatigue with that element of it. It had okay. a sense of novelty and yeah. it's worn off. And right. so it is interesting to so think about what's going to be the next. So a word that kept coming up in our discussion, and I think we're exactly right, it's wonderful to speculate about this now. It's so new that we actually don't know the answers to most of these questions. We do know you have to pay attention to it, and we do know we're in a transition. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you.